So I wanted to be inspired and volunteer as a lighting designer in one of the coolest venues I know. This is part one of a series where I take you with me on the first day of last year's journey from having no idea what a light design or a lighting console is and standing at the side while Ghana Beerbud, a surf rock band from Thailand, hit the stage. In a later video to my first light design for Sugar Candy Mountain, with a little help from my colleague, of course. And preparing a light show for John Spencer, who only wanted colors and not a single white light. And finally, no pressure at all when a camera crew from Rock Palast filmed for a German TV channel and Emily Zoe wanted no colors at all. And she exploded on stage. And October Lieber, who came with a very elaborate light plan with only half an hour to prepare. So we had to improvise. But first, how did all this get started, you might ask? Well, I had asked a friend to join me to a concert of Altin Gun one and a half years ago. They are a band from Amsterdam and one of the singers comes from Istanbul. And they're reviving psychedelic rock music that was popular in Turkey in the 1960s. This song is from the latest album that they hadn't released back then, so I bought their previous album after the concert. And was signed by all the band members. And my name is even on it, because the bass player who started the band is also called Jasper. And last year, their new album was even nominated for a Grammy Award in the category of Best World Music Album. Pretty awesome. I had seen them before in a festival and wanted to see them again. So this friend had said before that he was volunteering as a sound technician at Vera, but I never thought anything of it. And after the concert he asked me to join the lights group and showed me the lighting console, which is where you operate the lights from. He said, you only have to work twice a month, you can see all the bands for free and work for a different band every time. So you're from the sound group, I said, why not the sound group? Well, the sound group is full and you might join later when there is a spot. He told me that the light group works along with the sound group and we could hang out backstage before the concert. You know what, I said, I'm gonna do it. I'm up for a challenge. The only thing to do was to talk to Edwin, who's the chief technician and in charge of the light group. After a short talk about what motivated me, he invited me to the first light group meeting. He just wanted to make sure that I didn't just join to see all the concerts for free and turn out to be a complete slacker. It was a bummer I had to wait till after Eurosonic 2019, but I crushed it this year. The Eurosonic Festival showcases more than 350 bands from all over Europe. And there's a band in every venue, bar, coffee bar, and even in a grand church. And since I had zero experience, I would have been in everyone's way. And just because it's relevant now, this year's Eurosonic was five weeks before the annual carnival at the other side of the Netherlands, and it's Corona land over there right now. Kind of like what happened at Mardi Gras in New Orleans. And we were incredibly lucky because of the timing, including all the musicians who could have brought it here and taken it back all over Europe. When I got to the venue, I was greeted by a friend of a friend who I had known for more than 10 years. It turned out that he came for the light group meeting too, and I had no idea. During the meeting, we all sat around a large dinner table and got a schedule of the next couple of weeks. After everyone introduced themselves to the new guy and I introduced myself, we discussed all that happened since the last meeting. There had been some technical difficulties during the Eurosonic festival. And you know, every discipline has their own lingo, so there are lots of new words like scrawlers, DMX, washers, frontlight, hazer, profiles, and I had no idea what most of those things even meant. Some of my new colleagues were still hung over from the festival because a lot of them actually do this professionally. So they have been working at some other venue and partying afterwards probably. One of my new colleagues explained later that he volunteers at Vera because it allows him to try out new things and get a chance to work for bands he wouldn't otherwise have a chance to work for. And it's a lot of fun to do, of course. Then we went through the schedule of upcoming bands and you could yell if you wanted to work that day. So if you don't go to the meeting, you can only pick scraps. No. 
they're all cool bands and sometimes people have other things to do. But we always fill the roster, I know by now, maybe even on the same day. And that's a good incentive to go to the meeting because you're lucky most of the times and you get to choose. And the free beer afterwards, of course. Unfortunately, I hadn't listened to any of the bands listed on the website, so I had no idea which one to choose. And I had to ask around what style they played. Big mistake, and that was quite silly. And I chose Ghana Beer Boot. Hello everyone, we are Ghana Beer Boot from Thailand. A surf rock band mixed with traditional elements from Thailand that I had never heard of before. I found out that most times there are two lighting technicians, but if you're new, you can tag along as the third person. And that's exactly what happened during the first day I worked. We all walked into the venue hall at around 4 p.m. And what I saw was not what I had expected, because the venue hall was a bit of a chaos. And it turned out that the last event, the day before, had been a lecture about the history of hip-hop. And another group called the Humpers were still standing up the stage because part of it had been lowered the day before, as this was a seated event. Also, the lighting console was nowhere to be seen because the lecture didn't require a full light show and to save space for more seats. My two new colleagues, who had been doing this for more than 20 years each, gave me a tour of backstage. We picked up the lighting console from the storage space of the light group, which had been locked up because of the lecture. We took it out of its flight case and put it on a table made from more than 30-year-old stage risers that had just been put in place by the humpers. This was a well-oiled machine. My colleagues asked them if tonight the hall was half size, and apparently it was. Well. That meant that there is a red carpet directly behind the lighting console, which reduces space and accommodates smaller crowds. And they took a lot of time explaining me all the basics, and because there was only one band that night, there was more than enough time. And at first glance, the lighting console looks just like a mixing desk, and because it's next to the mixing desk, I would have always assumed that that's what it was. People here all call it a light table, which is a word-for-word -word translation from Dutch, so I might slip in that term accidentally. First he asked me if I had checked out the band on YouTube, and um, apparently I hadn't learned anything from my previous mistake. So how can you ever choose a filter color then, they said. Because most of these lamps are still the old-school technology, with powerful incandescent light bulbs that get super hot. The lamps aren't being made anymore and we plan on using them till the supply runs out. These so-called PAR lights or PAR cans have color filters that you have to change manually. My colleagues put me to work and had me change all the filters in the lamps. They decided on a beautiful purple, amber and cyan and pointed out which filter needed to go in which lamp. The purple filter is actually called deep purple, even though it is more like pink. And Deep Purple was a lot easier to remember than Lee 797. And what's cool about the old-fashioned bulbs is that when you turn them down, the color becomes really warm and beautiful. LEDs are much more efficient, but really good ones are still pretty expensive. During building of the stage, cheap fluorescent lamps called work lights were turned on. But before the show, these are turned off and we switch to the lights above the audience that can be controlled from the lighting console. Earlier this year, most of these audience lights have been replaced by LEDs and about 30 of them were kept as spares and another 30 were given away. So I managed to pick one up. I put the spark can on a microphone stand, which is actually common practice. And this is how you install the filter. This is always the fiddly bit when you're standing on a ladder. This one went smoothly. PAR actually stands for Parabolic Aluminized Reflector, which is this thing in here. We usually install a 500 watt lamp, but you can install a 1000 watt lamp, which is insane. That's 25, 40 watt light bulbs. And this is the biggest in size. This one's called PAR64, which stands for 8x8 inch, which is the size of the reflector, which is about 20 centimeters. This is 8 inch. There's a whole circle of 12 PAR cans right above where the drummer usually sits. One of our lighting designers came up with this rather creative location of the lamps. And sometimes it's really cool to make them all just one color, as you can see during this Stonefield concert earlier this year. 
I had asked my colleague who designed the light show that night, and he told me it was either ultimate violet or dark lavender. It's some funky color, but not deep purple. Here we use different combinations of colors in the circle. Everyone always starts changing those filters first before the band gets in. Because otherwise you have to move around the drum kit and the amps with a ladder. Because you don't want your ladder to touch the microphone stands in front of the guitar amps and around the drum kit. The sound technicians put a lot of work into setting them up just right. And it's kind of careless if you accidentally change mic position. We put groups of our three colors in the lamps. No open white. Which I learned was when you don't put any filter in a lamp. First, the hazer, which is kind of a smoke machine, needed to get some more hazer fluid. It can create a fine mist, which makes it easy to see the individual light beams. Sometimes the hazer gets a mind of its own and starts to puff smoke randomly. Even though this looks really cool here, it was completely unintentional, as my colleague who worked that particular show told me after the show. You can even hear a puffy sound as a large drop of hazer fluid starts boiling off somewhere in the machine. Luckily the smoke is water based and doesn't irritate the throat, so most bands don't mind a little smoke. But a few don't want any smoke. Well some can get enough. Do you get some more smoke machine? <laughs> oh, nice. And a few want to have all the smoke. Around that time the band started to walk into the hall. Just looking around casually. Well, actually, that was after the show, looking at the time the photo was taken. This was during the sound check, with the work lights still turned on. I noticed that the guitar player wore a sweater of exactly the same color as the cyan we chose for the filters. That kind of showed me that my colleagues had a good sense of the band and what kind of image they had. So on a lighting console there are more than 80 faders. And every fader can control a single lamp, a group of lamps or an elaborate pattern called a chaser which you have to program yourself. As you can see here, the chaser of all the purple lamps also has four of the purple lamps in the circle above the band. Before my colleagues started programming, they put fresh white tape on a lighting console. And with about 30 lamps to choose from, they programmed two sliders for each color, with a different combination of lamps for each slider. So, no overlap between the lamps and both faders will turn on all the lamps of the same color. Just mark the first letter of that color with a sharpie and you're done. Easy peasy. Note that the letter O meant orange instead of amber, but that's just nitpicking. And with the knowledge of today you can see it is a pretty standard Vera program, but back then this just looked like a complete mess. During the show you can fade between combinations of the same color or combine two colors with two hands and four fingers. Here one of my colleagues used the faders to literally play along to the music. But he could have also have used the grey flash buttons above the faders. And that's the same as switching the fader completely on or off. And this is where the amber and purple chasers were programmed. The P1 marking just means purple on rate master 1 or speed control number 1. Which is just another fader on the lighting console that controls the rate of the chaser. Here both the amber and purple chasers are turned on along with the moving lights. Which you will get to later. The amber looks quite like gold and it's a really beautiful combination. Then there are an additional 12 of those park cans that have a separate scroller. A scroller is a device you can put on the lamp that can scroll through an actual scroll of filters. Usually we just use one color, although you can make combinations of different colors. The scrollers are mounted on a normal par light or fixture and they work exactly the same. And one of them was a bit problematic during the first song of last year's Trigger Finger concert. It just wouldn't stop spinning. And you can clearly see how it manually cycles through a scroll of color filters. Trigger Finger's lighting designer just removed that fixture from the program, as you can see here, where the scrollers are a chaser of red lights. I was standing in the crowd and watched it all happen from my favorite spot, which is all the way to the front. 
and probably no one noticed it, apart from the lighting technicians. Ok, back to Ghana Beerboot. Then there's the moving lights. These spotlights have a narrow beam and can have a rotating pattern called gobo, as you can see on the stage. These have a color wheel, kind of like the scrollers. And the lights changing now is just another type of chaser. And the second type of moving lights are called washers. And washers have a very wide beam that can flood the stage with light. They are the red lights behind the musicians that create a colorful mist during this Eurosonic concert of the Blinders at Vera two weeks before Ghana Beer Good. These lights can have all the colors of the rainbow. And the mercury lamps inside all of the moving lights first needed to be turned on, which is a simple operation on the lighting console and one of the first things we did. These lamps are not dimmable and instead have a shutter, which just blocks part of the beam and just works like a dimmer. Opening the shutter also allows for better ventilation and if you keep the lamps on and the shutter closed during the summer, they can overheat. That means you have to turn them off Wait for 20 minutes and hope that they've cooled enough that you can turn them on again. And that's not what you want at the start of a show. The white light they emit is much colder or bluish than the old incandescent lights. As you can see in this other Eurosonic concert of the Psychotic Monks at Vera. If you look closely you can see the slightly yellowish open white lights. So no filter. Especially just before they turn off they're almost amber. But when you put a red filter in them you don't see much difference. It's dimming the open white. And that's something you can play with, but not right now. The moving lights have a gobo here, which gives the beams a nice shape. And there are the top and the side LEDs, which show a chaser of white lights. And they're just as cool as the moving lights, but the combination actually works well during this concert. The chaser here is kind of like Knight Rider, but the lights go from one side of the stage to the other. And it's a shame that part of rock and roll tradition that relied heavily on cheap park cans gets lost because the new lamps don't have the same character and the incandescent lamps are getting phased out. Of course it's much better for the environment. During the Emily's Away concert that I showed in the intro, I only used open white incandescent lamps and I relied heavily on turning them up just a little bit during the more quiet parts. But that's for another video, here I try to use other people's light shows except during the intro. Because I was still learning all of this during Ghana Beerboot. And finally there's the front light, which shines directly on the musicians. Photographers really love these because it allows them to make good pictures of the musicians faces. We usually don't put color filters in the front light, but you can do it. And we have strobes which we didn't need this time. And because that wasn't enough already, my colleagues decided to put a so-called strip light on the ground behind the drummer. Just because they could. One of my colleagues had installed exactly the same strip light during Eurosonic two weeks before. Count for nothing at all. Broken shadows filling Westminster Hall. Does my vote count for anything at all? This light is an extra, which requires more work setting up the light design, and you have to drag it off stage after the concert. But that shows that at Vera it doesn't matter whether it's an international festival with TV cameras or a band from Thailand most people wouldn't have heard of before. We always go the extra mile. So more than 80 lamps, most of which can be turned on or off individually. All the technology we have is state of the art 2010 rock and roll baby. <laughs> my new colleagues explained how the lighting console was programmed and my head just exploded. Way too much information so I tried to absorb all I could. Because you actually have to make a completely different program from scratch every time you work. Now in fact lots of people just look at what the previous group has done and start from there. Which is perfectly fine, sometimes leave some colors in or change them all. Because you don't want pink on a death metal concert, or maybe you do. This time we started a program from a basic Vera program. Just select a couple of lamps on the touch display and turn them up with a wheel on a console. Press record and then the button under the fader and you're done. The lamps you selected can now be controlled with that fader. But my colleagues were old school and didn't use the touchscreen. Instead they switched to another bank 
where every lamp was pre-programmed on a single fader. So they used the faders to program the same faders on another bank, which at that time was very confusing. And the tape on the lighting console ends up being completely covered in hieroglyphs. Because that's what they are, modern day hieroglyphs. At 7 o'clock straight, the artist host walked in and announced that dinner was ready. Of course we were pretty much finished programming, because for my colleagues it wasn't their first rodeo. And we walked upstairs and there were pots and pans full of curry waiting for us, smelling really good. I was also introduced to the hot sauce made for Vera by one of the sound technicians. But my colleagues made it abundantly clear that the band gets to fill the plate first. So we had to wait a couple of minutes for them to get off stage and walk upstairs. As we had dinner I tried to strike a casual conversation with one of the singers. But he absolutely didn't speak a word of English. Luckily the drummer spoke good English as well as our Italian tour manager. Interesting, getting a glimpse into the life of international tour musicians. After dinner the band relaxed on the couches and one of my colleagues told me that we had an hour left before the doors opened and we still had more work to do. Because the band was no longer on stage we could adjust the direction of the light beams. They change position easily when you replace the filters. Also the previous group might have used a different combination of lamps for each color and the direction of the light beams might not work anymore for this combination. One of my colleagues turned a single fader up on the lighting console, for instance only these green lamps. He walked to the center of the hall with me and we looked if the lights were symmetrical. Basically he was training me what to look out for and asked me which lamp I thought should be adjusted. My other colleague got on the ladder and followed our directions. It went something like this. Out, 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 yeah, stop, up, up, yeah, back, back. Okay, perfect, don't change anything. We went through all the faders and checked that the direction of the light beams programmed on that fader complemented the lights programmed on the other fader of the same color, like the purple lamps in this video clip. The very last thing to do was to make a static light design for before the show so the stage looks appealing to the crowd when the doors open. It doesn't have to be fancy like this, it's just for the atmosphere. Okay, now we were done with half an hour left before the doors opened and we went backstage because one of my colleagues wanted a well-deserved smoke and they decided to take turns each doing half the show. And five minutes before the start of the show, the sound crew and us went to our positions. My colleague immediately started dimming the lights above the audience. Not switching the fader off like that, but slowly dimming the lights. This signaled that something was coming and I could see people walking closer to the stage. And a couple of minutes later the band walked on stage and the DJ turned off the music. I think this clip was at the very beginning of the show, because you can still hear people talk in the background. During the show I tried to absorb what my colleagues were doing on the lighting console while looking at the stage, but the information hadn't sunk in yet. Before I knew the show was over, it must have been 50 minutes or so. And after the show they told me that from now on I would never be able to go to a concert without looking at a light show. And yeah, they're right on the money. From then on I really noticed when a light show is good, and especially when it's bad. They showed me how to turn off the mercury lamps and the moving lights and the smoke machine, which needs to blow out the remaining smoke fluid, before it can be switched off completely. We brought back the extra strip light to the storage space, and now it was time for a beer, because Vera has a very nice bar in the medieval basement. There are even bands here every week. Well, not right now, of course. After maybe our second beer or so, one of my colleagues took me back to the venue hall. The bartenders were cleaning up and they had turned on the work lights. We turned off all the stage lights and every other light from the lighting console. And finally the lighting console itself and the electricity to the theater lights. My colleagues had left everything on earlier because there were still people at the bar and the band were packing their gear. After checking the schedule on his phone he saw there was a concert the next day, so we could just put a dust cover over the lighting console and leave it like that. So now we were actually done and we could go back to the basement bar. And I'm pretty sure the band and their tour manager went for a beer too. And their tour manager came back a couple of months later with another band who played in the same basement bar. You might have noticed all the band posters behind me. They are all made by the Vera poster group on the third floor of the venue. More about them in another video, because this video is getting long enough already. Unfortunately, I don't have the poster of Hanna Beerbud. There was a pile of spare posters lying around when I entered the venue, but before I knew they were all gone. Probably because that poster is pretty awesome. 
Also, this video focused mainly on the lights we have, because that's what I learned the first day in the job. This will change in the next video, where I start to get my hands dirty on the lighting console. Also, this video took me more than a month to produce, and last week Vera has already opened for volunteers and club card owners to hang out. You have to buy a free ticket, and only 30 people are allowed, including the door and bar crew, and you have to leave at midnight. I went there and was able to shoot the backstage footage in this video and had a couple of beers with my colleagues and some people I didn't know yet. But no after party. But I invited three friends to my house, which is perfectly fine because we kept distance. They really liked the poster wall behind me that I made especially for this video. And then we watched all the Eurosonic footage at Vera from Rock Palast, reliving good times and I could say, that's you Mark. Okay, that's all for now. Press like if you enjoyed this video, subscribe to support the channel and press the bell icon to get a notification of the next video. You can always turn it off later. And you can also follow me on Instagram. My name is Jasper Oostuk, see you in the next video.